Awesome. Thank you, guys. And thank you, Leslie, for the, the intro. My name is Sarah Reed. If you guys don't know me, I'm Principal of Research and Design at Dialexa. Um, if you haven't heard of Dialexa, we're a research design and creation firm um, that specializes in technology products, uh, software, and hardware. Um, I'm obviously on the design side of the, the house, and so I specialize in trying to understand the voice of the customer and making sure that we create delightful experiences and that we work with technology and product to make sure we're addressing business needs and can design a solution within technology constraints. And so I'm really excited to talk to you guys a little bit today about, um, from my perspective, how we've been able to prioritize work and work collaboratively during um, a remote time where we're all remote and having to shift from in-person workshops to remote time. And um, from there, I'll pass it off to Shannon. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, so Shannon Graff, I'm a principal also on the research and design team at Dialexa. Um, more so on the research side, I have a background in psychology, uh, but uh, my 17 plus years in my career have been in um, applying technology and human, you know, understanding human behaviors and how they pertain to why people do what they do, specifically as they're interacting with products. So um, I ask a lot of questions in my work, um, but I also really like to understand, you know, business needs, user goals, and how we map the two. So bridging that gap and helping the businesses really understand the impact uh, their decisions have on their end users. So happy to be here and happy to talk about what we're about to get into. Yeah, so for today, um, we're going to have a brief conversation around uh, gaining crystal clear alignment with product teams and working from home environment. Um, Shannon and I are going to like focus on a prioritization matrix that we found super helpful in our toolkit um, recently in the past couple months. And so that's what we're going to focus on. And then we're going to make it hands on and we're going to get into a workshop environment where we get to utilize this tool and get a little more interactive. So I'm excited about that. Um, definitely, if you guys aren't familiar with uh, workshops, you know, in Shane and I do it a lot in our day-to-day our -day activity, and we focus on um, being able to get as much information as we can out of the, the stakeholders and people that we have, and we utilize that to, to learn in different ways. And we know that um, one size doesn't fit all, and we use this really to gain alignment um, between people and make sure we've got the right tools in our toolkit. So um, for you guys in there, uh, whether you're on video or maybe you can also uh, use some of the raise your hand feature, but I'm curious to know if you guys um, raise, can raise your hand if you've had a difficult time being on the same page with someone, and if you ever had that experience, I know I have, where I've been on <laughs> and I'm on a different page as my colleague, and we've had to, to talk it out. Um, also, raise your hand if you've played referee between different groups or people, because they both understood things differently and had that issue. And so, um, I kind of wanted to dive in a little bit about, like, why do we think that's a problem, and why do we think that happens? And um, I really like this analogy that someone gave to me where if we all imagine right now the color Coca-Cola red, like let's all spend some time thinking about that, that specific color and let's imagine it. And as I'm talking about it, you can kind of get a sense of what you think it is. Um, but if I was actually able to take a dropper and get the hex value of everybody's color that they were imagining in Coca-Cola red, it would turn out that we all have a slight variation of what that is. And so just talking things through doesn't necessarily mean that we understand and see it, even if we're being super specific and clear. And in fact, I've even Googled, like you can Google this now, Coca-Cola Red actually has a couple different variations, even in their brand. So there's even some mismatches there, um, uh, depending on the color. And the other thing that gets my uh, goat when it comes to being on misalignment and having that is my husband uh, is especially keys into this idea that he's an audible learner. And so he thinks he's super great at like understanding communication verbally and getting on the same page. And he kind of chides me about being a visual learner. But if you look at research, it turns out that we all have multiple ways that we learn, but like we've kind of somehow we found different ways to learn and we've typed cast ourselves to be either audio or visual or fit in that box. But it really turns out that for most of us to learn, we need multiple learning styles in order to understand something. 
And so that's one of the big reasons for me that I really like workshops or finding different ways that we can ingest information and uh, apply that information because that helps us be better people and that's just a, a human nature quality that we have. Uh, Shannon, did you have some thoughts on like why alignment is so difficult? Why alignment is so difficult? I think because oftentimes everyone has kind of a different stake in the game, right? Um, and so wanting to make sure your voice is heard, sometimes the only, the only thing people really want is to be heard, you know? Um, so let everybody have a voice. And this, uh, what we're about to talk about with the matrix gives everybody that chance to show that their voice has been heard. We're putting data in front of them that they actually came to the table with. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. Um, to your point, Sarah, different learning styles, different communication styles. Sometimes we don't always hear what people are trying to communicate and convey. So the more collaborative and different ways we can elicit that collaboration, as we'll talk about today, what are some tools to elicit uh, different ways to communicate just to find ways to be more effective in how we're getting our point across. So I think these are some tools and techniques that will hopefully uh, provide some value for you in your future workshops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree with that. And then I kind of want to get into even a little more talking about like uh, different communication styles and, and to me also being able to make things tangible versus conceptual. I want to get a little specific about um, what I mean with a, with a story and there was a project recently that I was um, asked to come on where they had done a lot of discovery work and they had spent um, four weeks really working on this platform problem. And they had done their due diligence to design some conceptual mock-ups. They had built a capabilities model, which I kind of have an example of here in that right hand um, screen with all those stickies. They had a, a rough understanding of what the capabilities they wanted this to be and they had a rough understanding of how to get there in the first uh, a couple months, like the rest of the roadmap down below. But some of the issues that they were having was, even though they painted this five-year picture and they painted this like near-term picture, the two didn't necessarily connect. And they were also facing this issue where they were ping-ponging between, we want everything in this MVP versus we want a very narrow, MVP and even the stakeholders kind of were flip-flopping back and forth on this. So they asked me to come in and help them with priority and some workshops to help uh, gain alignment on, you know, what is it that we truly want and what does MVP look like so that the engineering team and the design team could give great, es better estimates and realistic expectations of when um, they could put this out uh, into and start capturing some revenue and start making expectations around timing. And so this particular workshop was, was very helpful for us to be able to, you know, bridge the gap and connect some dots between what does MVP look like, even though we've done all this type of research. And uh, Shannon, I don't know if you had a, another story that was specific about why, why you needed to use this and what problems you were facing. Sure. So sometimes we're coming out of research projects or engagements or even stakeholder interviews with a lot of qualitative data. Um, so how do you get down to the so what? <laughs> what do we need to make sense of out of all of this data? And so kind of plotting those findings on a matrix and kind of just saying, like, hey, we heard this a lot. We didn't hear, hear this very much, you know, so just being able to give it a place to go so that you can start to make sense of what do we do with this next? You know, whether it's okay, that does have a place, but it might not be our immediate next step. Great, at least we're making sure that it's accounted for versus these things came up a lot and we gotta do something fast. So it's oftentimes a, a nice way to visualize uh, to some of your project sponsors, maybe the stakeholders involved and, and just kind of show your work and say, you know what, let the data speak for itself. It's a nice way to be able to do that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I specifically believe strongly in workshops because I think that helps us all move in that same direction and really helps us, uh, you know, provide focus and make sure we have the impact we need um, to move forward, right? Like in the example of um, this particular thing where they had to look at between the five years and the next couple months, that when we got by ping-ponging between a bigger scope and a large uh, and, a, and a smaller scope, they had lack of clarity and focus to be able to really make sure they, they hit that target and, and where they wanted to go. And so I find workshops like these really help get everybody together to make an impact. I also find that it's a good way to kind of kick a project off. Sometimes 
um, you know, teams have trouble getting started. There's kind of a stall of, you know, we know we're going to do this thing. How do we get started? Well, let's talk about objectives. What problem are we trying to solve? So kind of just creating dialogue and being able to kind of start to put things out and say, okay, wait, you know, we really think that this is, you know, got some high impact. Okay, let's put that on a matrix and kind of see where things land. Um, so just alignment on objectives, even as you're getting started with a project, this could be a valuable tool as well. Cool. So we're talking about this mysterious matrix. Let's get into it. So um, yeah, high level, we have a little summary um, for folks who might be less familiar with it. So it's just, as you kind of saw on the previous slide, it's a graph-like tool. Um, the purpose of it is to map out whether it's opportunities that you're trying to make sense of out of a research project, whether it's features to focus on from an MVP perspective, or like I mentioned, some objectives to align on to even just kind of figure out what project are we taking on and what does that look like? What are we going to be doing step by step? Um, so it's just a nice way to kind of plot things out and, and use it as a planning tool to put into whether that's a roadmap or, or a brief to sell up the chain. <laughs> Cool, so why do we use this? I think we've touched on it a little bit, but we'll kind of take you through more of the tactical. So again, it's, it's used to kind of prioritize, definitely is the key takeaway here. So what are we prioritizing? The beauty of this is you can define the axes for whatever problem you're trying to solve. So oftentimes it's gonna be level of effort and impact. So in this case, we'll probably talk a lot about user impact. Um, effort in terms of, you know, development resources, timeline, you know, what's it going to cost from the business perspective. So the beauty of that, again, you get to define the axes depending on what you're trying to solve for here. Um, in this case, you know, we've got effort by organization and user value. So in this case, when we're moving things into that upper right quadrant there, that's definitely something that we're going to take on. Um, but the, also the good thing too is other than just the things to focus on, it's the things that we don't have to worry about right now. Sometimes that can alleviate a little bit of stress and a little bit of tension of, you know what, that's just not as high of a priority as we thought it was, and that's okay. Um, again, it has a place, it just might be a little bit more on the back burner instead of the front burner. Great. So before we get hands-on, we want to talk about how to execute it. And I think we've touched on this a little bit. So again, the axes, they can vary. Um, again, depending on what you are, what the topic of the day is and what you kind of want to measure. So oftentimes, and probably most often for us, it's going to be what's the UX impact? What is it going to cost us from development and design perspective and the business effort? Does the business need to invest anything from a budget perspective, from a timeline perspective? Um, getting a little bit more tactical when you do get into the workshop settings or you do have a little bit more time. You can kind of get an Excel spreadsheet in front of yourself, do some columns. You'll have three columns. You're going to rank all of the factors, whether the factors are features, one through 20, one through 24, however many features that you're evaluating, um, research opportunities, that's where we get into the hundreds sometimes, um, or, you know, other objectives. So whatever factors you're going to be plotting. You can divide and conquer on this. So um, from a UX impact perspective, it might be more of the research and design side, working with product management to give it a ranking. So what is the impact for user experience here? Same with development. You can hand the list over to developers and say, hey, you guys from a development standpoint, we need you to rank this on a you know, one to 10, kind of like t-shirt sizing, so to speak. Um, but you get to let them use their expertise to rank these. We all come back together after we've ranked the factors according to our disciplines, and then we get to start plotting. And then from the business perspective as well, so whether that's your BAs, your products, uh, product owners, product managers, um, stakeholders that are involved, um, so everybody gets a voice, and this is the first par part of that. Um, so you're getting to rank, then we come together, we put a matrices, up on a wall, up on a window, um, up on a virtual whiteboard like we'll do today. Um, another way to kind of weigh the value and the impact is, um, so with some dot voting, you can use the dot voting method. As you can see here on the right, the bubbles by color and by size, um, that here is intended to measure um, the impact. So again, one way that you might vote is, you know, level of effort, and you know maybe developmental effort, but you also want to show what that user impact is going to be. So based on how you rank things, that's uh, another way to denote is through the bubble size and the bubble color here. 
the various ways to um, make sure, again, however your product teams are comprised, making sure everybody has a voice and there's always a way to show that, whether that's dot voting, using bubble colors and size, as well as plotting on the matrices. I'll pause here and see if Sarah, if you have anything to add on the execution. Yeah, so what I liked about talking to Shannon too about this particular thing is like, especially when it came to the bubbles, that's an, as as that's an aspect that I haven't really used before. And I thought that was really helpful for that third dimension of making sure that there's a conversation between design development and business on all the, the, the value and the effort. A lot of times what I've done in the past is really talk about the business value and the um, the development effort and plotting that along uh, in certain ways because that helped us have a conversation especially around development and the business about the trade-offs that they could make and so that's a common way that i've used it is just using the x and y and then being able to plot things around that so i liked hearing the spreadsheet and the and the bubbles because i thought that was like a cool way to like let people kind of have some free work and pre-thinking and then also show everybody together having a voice and a stake in it. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Great. So what do we do with the data from the matrices afterwards? So again, going back to, you know, who you're, um, you know, collaborating with, what you're trying to solve for. Is it a roadmap that you're looking to populate? Is it, you know, trying to identify MVP, um, how to tackle things first, next, last, um, objectives for project engagement. So um, you are able to kind of look at that pro uh, the matrix. And again, there's some quadrants you can say, you know what, not today. These are the ones that we're focused on. These are the ones that we're not focused on. That might be a point of contention. So you just want to main sh make sure you have clear alignment on the absolute yes and the absolute no's before you go and put it into your project plan or roadmap in this case. So talking about a couple times where we used this, um, I particularly had a case where um, we had a long list, as, as Shannon mentioned, potentially having. We had a list of 150 things, and our um, client's project uh, manager teams were just like, I don't know what to do with this list. I don't know how we're going to get it done. I don't know how we get it important. This is like a, a list on top of the 150 things that they had already prioritized, and they didn't know how this fit. So we were able to come together and use this tool and this matrix as a way to help us kind of give just broad stroke buckets of where these things let lie and so we were able to understand what was things that we could just totally drop off the list by anything that was on the bottom left hand corner and then anything that was on the the right bottom corner and the in the top left we were able to prioritize in near term like this is low hanging fruit that we can go ahead and, and get going and get done and then the stuff in the top right we were able to then uh, budget more time and really talk about how can we break down these particular things because they're really valuable but we can't wait years for this to happen so what are some ways that we can work through these particular things and those are the things we want to discuss versus the other stuff we can kind of plan and execute on and so this was really helpful um, once again about having development and the business understand each other and for this particular organization they almost felt like they were at odds and were almost in rigid and inflexible and not understanding each other so this workshop helped them think through things understand where the other one was coming at and um, facilitate better conversation and it helped us you know break some things into bite-sized pieces so we could move forward on it um, and we could talk about uh, the customer experience and how it impacted um, based on the things that they were looking for. Two important things that Sarah alluded to here that uh, these tools are really helpful in doing is generating dialogue as well as making things look less daunting. So taking something from this list of 150, that seems overwhelming to, you know what, we can break this down, it can be doable, we're just gonna work through it, right? Um, so again, um, I really like using these as tools for dialogue and facilitating dialogue. Um, oftentimes I just kind of say, look, the data is speaking for itself, but in this case here, we were using this, um, how many of you have had a stakeholder or a client or somebody who's excited and wants to do all the things and do them yesterday, but there's a timeline and a budget involved. 
that hopefully is pretty common so that I don't feel alone in that. <laughs> but in this case, um, we were in a two-day workshop and that second day, you can see here over on the left side, uh, we used a window because kind of in a pinch, I said, you know what, we need a matrix. And so I went and took a marker, wrote the matrix, gave everybody some post-its. Um, we did some dot voting. The colors in this case don't mean anything. It was just more of how many dots can we get on a post-it to really understand value and impact uh, or value and effort rather. And so this was in the middle of a workshop and we weren't necessarily planning on doing this as an activity. It's just one of those I like to have in my back pocket. So little tip, this is a good one to just kind of throw up if you need it, not throw up, but put on a wall or on a window if you need it. Um, just to kind of generate that dialogue. <laughs> yeah, a lot of it does come out on the window, um, just a lot of ideas. But again, that's what you want. You want to get people talking that maybe otherwise they're going back and forth on email or back and forth via another mouthpiece. Well, if you have them all together, this is a really good way to kind of say, okay, let's talk about it. You know, here are all the factors we're trying to discuss and make decisions around, and, and here we go. Let's, let's vote on it and see if it really is as important or really is as impactful as we think it is. Um, so again, really good to, uh, tool to use to generate conversation. And I did want to give a nod to a question that I saw. Do you come back with the aggregated data or, uh, let me see, or do the aggregation during the workshop? Great question. And um, Kimber, it depends. It depends on, in this case, we had six folks in the room. Um, if you have a large number of stakeholders, if it's more of an engagement and where you do have, in Sarah's case, more of a list of 150, as long as you have that list coming into the workshop, I would say how much pre-work you've done really does kind of depend on what aggregation is needed. Um, in most cases, I would say we've broken this out into maybe a two-day workshop where we have time to actually execute, plot the data, and then we go back and make sense of the data and kind of work with the stakeholders one-on-one. -on -one. In other cases, if it's more of a small setting where we can just have that kind of <laughs> candid dialogue with folks in the room, um, it is pretty easy. In this case, it was very easy. We had six stakeholders. We were able to, you know, take 30 minutes to jot things down plot them on the matrix, move them around, have the conversation. So I'd say a couple of factors there are the size of the group that you're working with and how much pre-work has been done coming into the workshop, because um, that will determine if there needs to be some, you know, significant aggregation done between uh, the days of the workshop. Also, how much time you have and what you're solving for. So I hope that answered your question. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to piggyback on that, I definitely, from the, in my use case, we had a little bit of pre-work. So while I didn't necessarily do the, the whole spreadsheet thing, I, we did have both technology and the business had the list and they were able, like they knew we were going into this. And so we did ask them to consider and think about it. I also want to touch a little bit on other prioritization frameworks because we talked a lot about um, this particular matrix. Um, but there's a few that I've used recently just from switching um, to, to COVID and also from working remote. I found some of these things being easy to use on, on remote workshop boards as well as, as the prioritization workshop is also easy to use. But these particular ones I've used recently um, since we've been in the pandemic. And the other thing I like about these is depending on your context, um, some of these prioritization workshops work better. So for example, um, I've used the Kano model when I've worked with uh, like startups that have very long backlogs. So it was a case where the startup had, had gotten traction and this, any cool idea and anything new um, that they chased, they ended up growing a bigger and bigger backlog because there's only time for the most important thing, but they like would deprioritize a lot of stuff and keep it in the backlog. So we started onboarding new members for the startup and it was just daunting to have this giant backlog. And the Kano model was something we could do quickly with the uh, stakeholders as well as with some of their um, customers to really help us prioritize the backlog between what's something that is making your app delightful, what's something that's making your service just, you know, is baseline, and what are two, like, two or three things that we just don't see adding value or, you know, not a, a crazy thing. And so um, that was really helpful for us to, instead of trying to have them emotionally talk about it, because the Kano model has numbers to it, they were just able to fill out a survey and felt much more really relaxed and relieved of you know, deprioritizing, I think maybe three fourths of that 
um, idea list that they originally had in their backlog. Shannon, I know you had another good use case for using this one. Yeah, I've seen the Kano or Kano or Kano method work really well in a research environment where sometimes you have stakeholders that are really big on quantitative as well as the qualitative. And this is kind of a way to, I call it user informed quantitative data. So um, you would typically recruit 12 to 24 respondents depending on the complexity of the issue that you're solving for, but also the variety of the population or your target audience. Um, so sometimes that can that can get pretty big, um, but it really does help kind of um, solve some arguments, um, break down some barriers, or even alleviate again some stress. I've kind of seen just the numbers be able to kind of support the qualitative data that they might be hearing from, you know, whether they're call centers um, or whether it's feedback that they're getting from their customers. Um, but it kind of lets the quantitative speak for them as well. Um, so I've used it a lot in a research um, environment to, as part of the mixed methodology approach to research, but also when you're in a pinch for time and budget, it's a good way to get that quantitative piece in there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I've used the Moscow method, probably the second most common one I've used because it helps with our must-haves, should-haves, could-haves, and won't-haves, and that helps with people's priority when it comes to releases. So when we talk about must have, what are the things that we won't, you know, must need to be in there. The should haves help us kind of have a conversation between technology and own business owners around what, you know, how should this work, but is there some other compromises or trade-offs that we can have? And then the could haves are things that are just like nice to have that we can get to and won't have for this release is something that really helps us you know prioritize and bucket all these things and i would say i started out with that with that one story of us coming in and helping with the between the five-year roadmap and the short-term build it this year roadmap and the, the things not connecting and the dots not connecting we use the moscow to facilitate the conversation i personally found that having um i had all their capabilities lit up and it was the idea was we were going to turn it on and off on the mural board um but i found that being very cumbersome to use based on the amount of capabilities we had and we in fact even added more capabilities as we were talking about it the smus found out more things that were like oh this is actually really important to have when we started talking about priority um so i actually moved and pivoted from using moscow to just going into swim lanes because the, the stakeholders only had a couple hours, the conversations by using Moscow were getting a little uh, elongated. And so I just pivoted to swim lanes just to have, this is our you know, must have first release, this is fast follow, and this is probably gonna be punted to a second release. And that was much, that helped us keep in bounds of having an important conversation about the next, you know, uh, the next release cycle and answering timeline questions by being able to have, you know, maybe just two, I think we had one and a half hour sessions on, on uh, the priority. And so that helped the swim lanes of pivoting to that was much more easy for me to move stuff around and facilitate conversation and still see the whole thing. Um, so that's kind of my little two cents of what I learned when doing these activities online. Um, Shannon, I'm sure you have some thoughts on it too. Yeah, just a quick piggyback. I find Moscow to be really effective if you get to do stakeholder interviews often, kind of in lieu of research and, and in lieu of being able to go out into the field, which a lot of us can't right now. Um, Moscow has been really helpful in facilitating a stakeholder interview, but then doing some stakeholder alignment at the end of those interviews. So if you have the luxury of being able to get those one-on-ones and then having kind of that workshop at the end, um, those must-haves, should-haves, could-haves, that's something you can actually take into the matrix that we're about to start doing. That sounds really intense, like going into the matrix, but plotting on the matrix that we're about to do. Um, and need to, to your point in the chat here, coming out of Kano, this is something that I would use. Um, so if you can't get quite alignment, you know, you're not getting enough differentiators out of the Kano, that's when I would actually go and plot it in a workshop in a collaborative environment and use the matrix to kind of help you tease out, okay, really what do we mean when we say this is a priority? Is it really up here in this quadrant or is it more of a next year type of priority? So that's a recommendation I would say that would be worth a try. Cool, awesome. And then we wanted to provide some resources for you guys. So the thing I have first on here is this mural board. That's what we're gonna be using the, the, work, the tool we're using for the workshop today. 
Um, Miro is also very popular, and I have no al al allegiance or alliance to one or the other. I think they're both very similar. Um, Miro is just the one my company ended up choosing. Um, I've also used the tool AHA, and that's something that has been super helpful for us to build our strategy and do these kind of prioritization workshops. In fact, some of the screenshots I have are from that tool. And that allows us to connect our strategy straight to the, like it has an integration with Jira. And that's been helpful to connect our strategy to the actual work that's being done and actually be able to carry that thread through. Um, I will say disclaimer, there's a, a, a person at our um, company that is great with AHA and he's answered all my questions. Um, I don't think I would use this tool if it was just up to me to pick it out because because it has great integrations and a lot of flexibility, it's very complicated to use and I don't think I would have had the patience to figure it out myself. And so that's my one caveat for that tool is, you know, unless you're great at researching, reading, and you that's like your jam, then I'd say go for it or find somebody else who can help you out with it. Um, their support was great. I just wasn't getting the answers I needed in time, but it's been, I've used it to help communicate dependencies um, about different things, communicate our strategy and how that worked with the JIRA tickets and what the progress was on it. So I've, I've seen it, you know, be one of the tools that's uh, immersive and end-to-end -end that way. Um, the other thing on here that I thought was helpful to, to, we didn't touch too much on roadmaps, but a lot of this prioritization is about building and, and the outcome becomes a roadmap. And product roadmaps relaunched has been a really helpful tool for me because it, it talks about the theming of your roadmap. It kind of breaks down different pieces. And all of these activities that we talked about, prioritization activities, they actually have a little blurb of in the book that's helpful cheat sheet to go to about like, here's your situation of what your priorities are. Here's when to use these kind of tools. So that's another great resource. And then, um, I think, Shannon, I'll pass it off to you to explain some of these, uh, the Kano, Kano or Kano model <laughs> things. Yeah, so there's a good video, uh, if you're unfamiliar with Jared's Fool. Um, so he actually did a good talk, talk about kind of turning the data into a product or UX strategy. And so uh, that video is out there on Vimeo, and um, it, it's a good resource. I think it's around 24 minutes. So it's worth just kind of, even if you have the time to listen to it, it you'll walk away with some good tidbits there. Um, I think those are our resources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the folding burritos is also there that I mentioned oh, yeah. with it. And that's the one I used as my like Bible to utilize it because he does a great job breaking down the science behind it. And then I'm able to like copy and paste and even refresh it because that's probably the most like complicated one out there. So now we're ready for our, our, our Q&A. And Shannon did a great job kind of eyeing out the chat and answering sure them as we go. <laughs> Good impression and great multitasking. <laughs> that was fantastic. Mother of a toddler. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. No, I mean, listen, that was amazing, really rich content that I think everyone is always just really kind of grasping for, right? Real life examples, real life tools. Um, how flexible they can be to pivot from one to the other, how they're great forcing mechanisms for really robust, and I always like to say healthy dialogue, um, you know, because not everyone's always going to be aligned. There's going to be kind of different variables that everyone's taking into account for different prioritization, not just methods, but, um, you know, when you really kind of get into that feature set of what you want to push out when from a value prop standpoint, it's just so important to have some sort of facilitation and, and modeling behind that. So awesome, awesome information, you guys.